so hi Katrin, welcome. To Thank you. Uh, in order to stay brief, uh, I think we can start directly sure. with the questions. So my first question to you is, uh, what do you think are the most valuable democracy principles that uh, is, are present in, in the Rookie Media Foundation? Mm -hmm. In the foundation or in the movement? Uh, well, uh, it should be both actually, but mm -hmm. you can, if, if you think there are differences, you can then specify what are the differences. I think that there are similarities, but they're not the same. So the things that I tend to think about as being really important are the Wikimedia Foundation, sorry, the Wikimedia Movement's commitment to transparency um, and the commitment to discussion and consensus as a form of dialogue and issue resolution. Um, I think that what we have at the foundation includes the commitment to transparency, but it is not the same as a consensus-based structure. So the, the transparency commitment, I think, is incredibly important because it ensures that we document our actions, we enable clarity as to how decisions are made, um, and it allows for participants in those decisions to have better information about why decisions were made, mm -hmm. the timing of those decisions, the rationale, etc. But it also allows people who are new entrants to the movement to be able to learn about the history of the organization. So there's transparency, which means that people are able to join with a better understanding. Mm -hmm. The other component about transparency that I think is really important, and this applies to the movement as well as to the foundation, is transparency can be a form of accountability to make sure that the foundation, for example, is responsible to the movement in the way that we use funds, but also that the movement is responsible to itself, to each other, and then to the readers who we serve with our work. Um, I think that those are really important. The consensus-based commitment, I think, is very unusual because we don't do upline, up-down voting, right? We yeah. think about, what we ask people to do is engage in a process of dialogue around the merits of ideas and then make a determination based on sort of support and persuasion, essentially. And I think that that's a really healthy dialectic that is very unusual in most other communities. Yes, uh, thanks. And actually your answer brought me to a question that I had here. It was a bit uh, down, but I think I, it's a good time to have it. And it's about uh, the criteria of involving people in the community. So uh, actually my question is, what would you say is the criteria to, to, for someone to have his voice heard or her voice heard in the community? And I can be more specific. So what we're seeing right now is that it's usually editors or active editors mm -hmm. that are mostly uh, involved also mm -hmm. in the discussions. Mm -hmm. What about someone who is just reading Wikipedia? Yeah, They're I, also users. I think this is a really great question and I think it's a tension we have, right? Mm -hmm. So historically in the foundation we used to measure active editors as people who had five or more edits a month. Mm -hmm. Even today we were talking about user groups needing 300 edits in order to apply uh, with each of the sort of participants. I think that Edits are a useful metric, but they can't be our only metric because they preference people who have more time and more ability to participate. They don't actually measure intent or passion or even a person's sort of understanding of an issue. Um, I think that that's one thing that we need and are looking at within the foundation and within the movement writ large is as we move away and as we grow into places in the world where there are barriers to participation, we need to think about what participation looks like and how we give affordance and weight to that. Um, so in order to make sure that we're more inclusive and we have a diversity of voices. To your point about readers though, I think this is a really difficult tension because your average Wikimedia contributor I think does think about what a reader is looking for and cares about what a reader needs, but it tends to be an anecdotal experience. It tends to be, I would be looking for this, or you know, based on what I've heard from a couple people, it, it, very often we lack the ability in aggregate as a community to have an understanding in aggregate of the way that readers interpret the sites, use the sites, have questions about the sites, you know, and then you forget about the projects, think about the broader internet ecosystem, we're missing the context for how like the internet is changing or consumption patterns are changing. So my feeling on this is that this is actually where the foundation can play a critical role. If, for, if nothing else, the foundation's responsibility is to keep the projects running. Um, and in, as part of that, I think that the foundation is uniquely resourced. We have access, I mean, as do many of our editors, but we have access to the data in aggregate. We have people on staff who are tasked with analyzing and understanding user behaviors and user trends. 
And so I see that as our responsibility at the foundation to be able to provide a research-based perspective on how usability is changing in the world the ability, and to do that through both qualitative and quantitative analytics. We can measure the changes in traffic, we can measure how users are engaging with the sites, but we can also go out and do that sort of user-based research to say, what is it that you need, how do you, and then we can bring that back to the community and then use that as a point for dialogue with the community about changes that that should happen in, in the projects overall. So. We can, you know, and some of that's through direct surveys. And so, we at the foundation, I think, our responsibility is to ensure that we are creating space for the voice of users and representing or bringing that into conversations with the editing community. Yes. Thanks. Uh, and since you've been talking about the ac accountability of the foundation, I know it's a very broad subject and it can be a difficult question, and we don't have time to discuss all of it. But I have just a part. Uh, that I would like to discuss because it's a bit unclear for me uh, from what I've been reading. Uh, so, um, how can we say, how can we, how is managed the case that someone maybe, for example, in your role, mm -hmm. uh, comes and uh, abuses the uh, democracy principles that you have been talking about? And of course, it's not about you, it's just in general. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, how can the uh, community act, especially if the community is not aware about this because it happens in the foundation? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that one of the things that I really appreciate about the foundation is that we have, my bosses are the board of trustees, and the board of trustees is meant to have a weighted balance in favor of community. So you have 10 trustees, you have four that are appointed, and you have five that are community nominated, and then you have Jimmy as the founder who represents a community voice. And so the idea is that you have 60% always in favor of the community. So in that governance model, we should have a form of accountability to the community through like my boss, right, mm -hmm. or the ED's oversight. Um, and because of the fact that those are community nominated or community elected into those positions, that should also mean that the board itself is accountable back to the community. And so the theoretical structure, I think, works well. We know it doesn't always work as quickly as possible, and we also know that it, only works if the board is engaged in oversight of the organization and if the organization is being transparent and clear about what its intentions, projects, funding, etc. are. Um, one thing that I think is under-recognized in the organization is that we actually have a number of community members in the foundation. And I think that that community presence in the foundation is really important, both as a means of ensuring that we remain true to our values, but also maintaining connections and information flow between the community and the foundation itself. Uh, so I think that that is a means of ensuring that there's never sort of, there shouldn't be a blockade of information between the, where the foundation becomes siloed from the community, that there should always be sort of those open flows. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, the part of the thing that I think is very unusual about the Wikimedia movement is the right to fork. We don't talk about it a lot anymore, but we used to talk about it a lot when Wikimedia was younger. The idea that the content of the Wikimedia sites is freely licensed, the code is open source, and so in theory, anybody who wants to could walk away and say, hey, look, we don't want to deal with the foundation anymore, we're going to go set up a, a you know parallel form. And now, possible. I think, and I think it's very powerful because if we at the foundation were to hear that that was the case, you know, I, I think we would say, oh gosh, something is really wrong. Now, I hope we would never get to that point, but I think that the right to fork is is a means of accountability as well. Yes, you're completely right. Uh, I want to come back to a point that you you've talked about. And uh, it's uh, that the community is represented in the foundation, and this is very true. And even in the uh, board of trustees, mm -hmm. but uh, I have a question that is actually kind of generic, and it can happen also in uh, Wikipedia or in the Wikimedia Foundation. And it is about uh, the fact that someone comes from uh, the community and represents it doesn't always and necessarily mean that they will. Uh, uh, represent the interests of the community. That's and, uh, true. I can draw a parallel, for example, with the parliaments or governments. Sure, so absolutely. people uh, go there and they have good intentions, but mm -hmm. you know, with time, you can maybe change your interests or uh, discover some new things. And, and to be truthful, mm -hmm. the position of a board member is not to represent their community, it is mm -hmm. to govern the foundation. And so there is, I think, often a um, this is actually an important distinction. When you're elected into the board, you don't represent the Wikimedia project you came from. You represent, you become a responsible governance 
you become responsible to the functioning of the foundation as a whole. So that, that you're absolutely right. The alignment of your actual incentive structure changes a little bit when you become a member of that board. It's the election system that keeps, that theoretically keeps you accountable. But to your question, uh, which I think is around how, what is the actual accountability? Or I want to make sure. Uh, I, I have it written here. Sorry. So okay. Can, no, no, it's a, no problem. Uh, it's how can you combine between the interests of the foundation, mm -hmm. even the community members that become part of the foundation, and the uh, interests of the community, yeah. because they might be conflicting sometimes. And sometimes they are. Sometimes mm -hmm. they are in conflict. I think that the the truth is. We're always going to have some conflict somewhere. Mm -hmm. You can't have 250,000 people trying to agree on everything. It's just, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not possible in any form of governance. What we have to have is a form of governance that allows for us mm -hmm. to agree most of the time on most of the things. And that agreement needs to shift among parties so that you don't have a dominant party that wins, for example, in decision making every time. Because if you end up with that, you end up with a minority party that is disenfranchised. So the idea is that sometimes, you know, we're going to disagree on some things, but hopefully next time we'll agree and maybe, you know, that disagreement sort of moves around. I think that that's the only healthy way to function. I think the places where we see the incentive structures of the community and the incentive structure of the foundation sometimes come into conflict get to this idea that the foundation's responsibility is to keeping the projects effective and um, high performance and shared with the broadest number of people, but also contributed to by the broadest number of people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what we see is in certain cases, certain communities not wanting, for example, to have new editors come into the projects yes. because they think we've built all of our policies, we know our workflows, and new editors are disruptive. Mm -hmm. I think that the place where sometimes this can come into tension is when we talk about the, as I said, when some editors don't want new editors on the site, for example, or sometimes we see this around uh, formats for learning and consumption. So we know that people are interested in consuming information that is more multimedia, for example, and currently that's somewhere where we've seen tension around integrating video content into Wikipedia. So that tension is a tension that exists between what is the need for getting knowledge to the greatest number of people, or what is the need for how we might change and evolve the projects so that they are more welcoming to a larger number of people. Mm -hmm. I think a very obvious example of this is you have the issues of harassment on the projects, where you have people who are very prolific in the sense that they contribute a lot, but they actually also scare other editors away. That, that's intention with our goals, and it's intention between the community and the foundation sometimes. In those instances, we always try to resolve that tension through dialogue. We try to resolve that tension through having conversations about the intent of what we're trying to do, or um, understanding what would be most useful for community members around this point of conflict. So if it's, if it's an issue where for example, a community member says, look, you just, we can't have new editors because they screw everything up. Mm -hmm. Then we'll say, well, what are your workflows right now? Like, how can we make your workflows easier? How do we address this challenge? What if, what if we thought about um, supporting you through a new tool that made it easier to review new changes? Things like that. And so we try to take the approach of let's find the pain point so that we can achieve a mutual goal. Because it's rarely that people contribute to Wikipedia and they don't actually want more editors. It's just they say, hey, look, I, we just can't absorb this at the moment. So let's find ways to try to work through that. We have not always been perfect. We've screwed up in the past, for sure. I think Visual Editor is a great example. When we rolled this out the first time, everyone's like, it broke our workflows, you know? Um, but we're, I think we're much better at it than we used to be, and we're going to continue to try getting better. It's excellent that you talked about the Visual Editor. Yeah, yeah. That was my next question. All right, let's talk about uh, it. I read it actually in uh, Mark's uh, dissertation mm -hmm. thesis. He wrote about it. And uh, actually, the, what I'm interested about in this uh, specific case is the decision making. So not only about visual editor, but it's usually on the software mm -hmm. in Wikipedia or any other uh, related project. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, community is feeling that the decision is made uh, outside of their... Uh, unilaterally. Yes, yes, unilaterally, and uh, they just discover it after it. And uh, of course, they can give negative feedback and things can be rolled mm -hmm. up. But uh, the, 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 my question is, uh, why is the decision so? And in a, 
is there any discussions that the process can be changed in Absolutely. the future? Absolutely. So I think we're already we're already changing those processes. We mm -hmm. just rolled out a new tool in beta that allow it's called interaction timeline, and it allows a user to add the name of another user and see where they've interacted on the sites in the past. And the idea behind this is that we in part it was to address harassment on the sites um, so that people could identify like harassing behaviors and patterns of interaction more easily as they look into um, violations of, of policies around civility, for example. For us, we worked with people who do this sort of work, who are investigating, for example, claims of harassment to understand what would be a useful tool for them. We showed that prototype to these editors and they were able to say, hey, like fix this, maybe that, not this, and gave us really good feedback. And so by the time we actually built anything, we were building something that we already knew the community members wanted. Another good example of this is um, we applied ORES, which is the machine learning uh, work that we've done to uh, review new edits, so recent changes. If you look at the recent changes feed, we now have a tool that lets you say, I want to look at uh, edits by new users, and then I want to look at edits that are going to be good faith edits, or likely to be good faith edits. Mm -hmm. When we built some of these tools for recent changes, we initially said we should just change, recent changes is a mess, it's really hard to understand, you have to be an expert. And so we built this beautiful wireframe, it's what you know it's called, mm -hmm. and we showed it to editors and they were like, that's terrible. They were like, this breaks our entire workflow, please don't build that. And so even though we thought that was a good solution, our editor said, not a good solution. And so we went back and we changed it to a solution that was better for editors. And so now we rolled that out and people are like, hey, this is really great. We've enabled it. We, like, it's, it's very popular in beta where it exists today. So we've already started making these changes around when we make changes in the projects, we want to have the conversation first with the editing community before we actually build software. And I think that that's, it's moving the point of conversation from what it, where it used to be, which was, hey, we built this thing, we hope you like it. And most of the time people were like, no, we don't like it. Which is not even that necessarily the tool was bad, it's that, look, people have built their workflows, changes can break those workflows. Um, we might have been building something for somebody that wasn't you know, that particular user um, or use case. Now we look to try to build things that are based on the needs that our users are telling us that they have. We try to balance the distribution between building for experienced editors, new editors, and readers, so it doesn't feel like we're only building for like new con new contributors. Um, and I think we're getting better at it. We we're not perfect. We have a ways to go. But moving the point of conversation up to the beginning of a process, so that we have a shared understanding, tends to work much better. Now that's excellent because I wanted to ask you a question, but you answered part partially at, at the end. I wanted just to ask. Uh, what happens if, for example, some parts of the community would like to have changes and the others don't want to have changes? Let's say you want to do a software and this software is good for English-speaking mm -hmm. users and bad for German-speaking users. So this is fascinating. I'm glad you mentioned this because you mentioned reading Mark's yes. dissertation. Mm -hmm. One thing, Mark comes from the Catalan community. We mm -hmm. now know that the Catalan community is one of the easiest communities to work with in terms of rolling out new features. They tend to be very um, engaged with the dialogue. They tend to be interested in ways of in evolving their Wikipedias. So what we do these days is we start with smaller communities where the conversations are sort of easier to navigate for both sides, um, where more people can participate and in the conversation, and then we have more um, ability within the group. And then we roll out features progressively. So we might roll something out on Catalan, we might roll something out on Welsh, we might roll okay. something out on smaller wikis. And every time we do that, we get good feedback about this didn't work or you need to evolve this. So by the time it gets to somewhere like English or German, which are both of the larger, more conservative wikis, it gives, we have evidence of how a new tool has benefited other editors, which makes it an easier conversation. And sometimes, for example, in the case of visual editor by default, communities just choose not to turn it on. And we at that point say, hey, look, the tool exists, you can turn it on, you can use it, but like, we're not, we're not gonna force this issue, we're gonna be ready to have this conversation whenever you're ready to have this conversation. Yes, excellent. Uh, one um, question, and then I'll have the last one after this. Yeah. So uh, the, this question is about uh, inclusion. We, we've a bit talked about it, but uh, actually my point again is about decision making and governance. 
So, uh, you know that a lot of parts are not represented in Wikipedia or in Wikimedia in general. And uh, uh, I've been discussing with Mark and with Ludwig also, who's doing a PhD, yeah. and uh, we've both came to a conclu conclusion that there's some kind of a loop. So that uh, actually there are editors that are good and having a lot of experience and then those editors are involved in the process so they usually make decisions that are good for people uh, in their same status. That's right. Yes, which are, who are also editors and then it goes back. So in, in this context, how can we include new communities, for example new minorities, new countries, new people also in the decision making process if, if they're not existing? So one of the ways we did this in the strategic direction process which was more a high level policy than it was in project policy or product decisions was we were very intentional. We said we're going to have a conversation with existing editors mm -hmm. and then we're also going to have a conversation with people who are not editors yet mm -hmm. and that we're going to do research into why and what their impressions are of Wikipedia, what their barriers are to using mm -hmm. Wikipedia, what their needs are for free knowledge, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we're going to bring all of that research back and we're going to share it with the community so that we have that perspective represented and as we go through taking the feedback from existing editors and the feedback from people who we called basically we said people who are not represented yet or we're going to work to engage a dialogue around what we might need to do to change in order to create space for those new editors and so we were very we decided we wanted to be 100% sure we had that perspective documented as the point, starting point for conversation. And so the outcome of the strategy process around, for example, knowledge equity is very much about how do we create space for new people who are not in the conversation. From my way of thinking, even the, line, the language of knowledge as service is also about how do you create new um, form factors or new experiences that meet the needs of people who are not yet involved in Wikimedia. So that, those two things felt really important. At the level of the product and policy decisions, I think it's much harder. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also believe that the same process that we've been talking about, which is how do you start with the point of pain? Like, where do you identify? Where are editors bouncing out? Why are newcomers having a hard time? Because one thing we've seen is that it's not, we can always increase the number of people edit, clicking the edit link. But that's actually not the thing we should be focused on right now because the real problem is after people click the edit link, they don't stick around. Mm -hmm. So how, why, we need to understand why are people leaving and is it because as a newcomer to the movement or because they have a mar minority perspective that they're being excluded from conversations? And if that's the case, why are they being excluded? Is it because it breaks someone's workflow? Is it because it challenges someone's power? Is it because it represents a paradigmatic shift for a user that threatens their sense of identity? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then how do we sort of piece by piece by piece try to solve for these problems? And I think that the only way to do this is at a policy level. So what are the policies that exist on Wikimedia in general around, for example, uh, reliable sources? This is something that comes up all the time. How do we deal with the fact that reliable sources tend to actually mean Western or American sources? How do we, so maybe that's a policy that we need to have a conversation around. Um, it's at the product level, so how do we think about what the needs are for a user who's contributing asynchronously, for example, and maybe can't check every hour to see if their edit has been reverted or what the conversation is on a talk page. How do we create that space? Um, and I think it's also at sort of the, at the people level of how do we create and build leaders who represent new voices mm -hmm. in the movement so that they are more powerful voices mm -hmm. in the decision-making process. They're administrators, perhaps, on wikis. They are um, stewards at the level of the glo global stewards. They are represented in the affiliates. They are elected to critical governance functions like AFCOM or FDC or um, the board itself. And in doing, I think, addressing these three things, it's there's no one solution. There is only going to be a gradual, incremental, challenging <laughs> solution. But I think that what you see already today, the conversation, we are now twice as many countries represented here in Wiki and Daba than we were last year. Yes. So we're making progress. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. But, but, I, I see but we're making progress. We have also those kind of conferences are very helpful, so I completely agree with Yeah, that. I mean, I think that the only answer is, is piece by piece, edit by edit, yes. right? Just the same way Wikipedia was built. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, thanks. I have just the last question, yeah, and uh, the it's very broad, broad question also, but you can be brief if you want. And it's about 
you actually spoiled it because I heard, <laughs> I heard you talking a bit about it, but still I, I want to ask it because it's, it's a specific question. And uh, it has also to do with democracy and philosophers have been talking about this sure. a lot. But do you think that uh, in the movement and in the foundation, should we have uh, equity or equality between the communities and everything? And it's I, a very difficult question, I know, but mm, yeah. I tend to think equity. Mm. I tend to think equity. I mm. think that ideally if you invest in, I mean, the sort of idea is that if you invest in equity, you ultimately may achieve equality, but you have to start with equity. And, mm. you know, for the reasons for this is that we have different needs for different mm. communities. We have different goals for different communities. You know, the Welsh community probably has a very different goal than the Hindi community, mm. right? Different audiences, different needs, different purposes. Um, and so, and, you know, we talked about this a lot at Indaba, the support that is necessary to support the expansion of Wikimedia in Chad is going to be different than the support that's necessary to support the expansion of Wikimedia in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be responsive to the needs that these different communities have because the truth is we've already been doing that for other parts of the movement, we just haven't recognized it as that. You know, the North Americans were the first chapters to be non-national chapters. Why? Because North America, you know, it's it's too big. Or the United States, not Canada has a national chapter. It's too big. So we agreed, okay, you can have regional based chapters. That was a accommodation for a need set that existed. We should be as flexible to be accommodating for need sets for new communities. And to me that's the basis of equity is finding ways um, that we can invest that are focused on the needs of individual communities commensurate with those needs mm -hmm. and really being in dialogue about how do we do that. Yes, uh, well I shouldn't say my opinion but I agree also. I want to be about equity. And yeah, uh, yeah, it was a tricky question but yes. No, I mean, look, mm -hmm. you know, the, I guess the conceptual outcome of equity is that we all have equality but mm -hmm. I think equity is actually something richer. It says you have as much value in this conversation and as much investment and stake in this mm -hmm. conversation as I do and I think that that resets the tone for how we as a movement think about what a legitimate member of the movement is. I, When I first came in to this organization, it felt like the only people who had voices were people who had been here for 15 years and people who had powerful chapters and now I feel as though that's very that's, that's evolving. You have a change where actually energy and creativity is coming not just from the folks who've been here for a while, but also from new people who are reinterpreting what does it mean to be a Wikimedian? What does it mean to have free knowledge for their community? Because our goal at the end of the day is not to rebuild Wikipedia exactly the same. Our goal is free knowledge for every single person in which they can participate. So we're going to necessarily need to continue to evolve as we do that work because the needs are going to be different everywhere we go. Yes. So. That's thank you very much. Yeah. I wish you good luck. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's very professional. <laughs> thank you.